Greetings, everyone from New Zealand. You can begin today by sitting quietly for a few minutes and bringing our attention into the present moment. For everyone who's here, if you could find a comfortable place to sit, the body is energized at the same time in a position where you can allow yourself to relax. From the top of your head down to the base of your spine, sitting up, alert, and gently close your eyes. <clears throat> your hands can be placed one hand on top of the other in your lap. Begin by bringing your attention to your environment. A broad scope of mindfulness. You can be aware of the room, aware of sounds, aware of temperature, aware of this body. This body sitting here, this environment, With your eyes closed, where do you feel your body? Bringing our attention to physical sensations. We notice with every breath, there are sensations of the air flowing into our body, pausing, flowing out, pausing, and again flowing in. to establish grounded awareness in the present moment. If we are aware of the physical sensations, posture of our body, we can be assured that we are aware of the present. As we are aware of our body within this environment, also notice the space. Pay attention to the space in this room, surrounding us. As we establish awareness with our physical surroundings, with this physical body, that helps us to be more aware of every thought, mental state that arises, the 
what mood that we're in. Each time that we notice that we're thinking, simply upset, accept that, notice it, come back and check. Are we breathing in or are we breathing out? Check where can you feel your breath? Where do you feel it? Where do you notice it most clearly? Is it your nose? Is it your chest, your abdomen? Notice how your breath changes. At the end of every exhalation, we might assume that the next breath would be the same as the last. But after you breathe out, just try to watch. Watch, wait, no expectation. If the next breath is long, deep, it's fine. If the next breath is short and shallow, fine, that's fine. Simply allowing our breath to be as it's going to be. Each breath unique. Each breath part of this changing flow of sensations.
as you become more relaxed, careful of the mind wandering off. Maintain a certain energy of alertness, a balance, being relaxed, but also clearly aware. In the same way that when we are aware of our environment, we can bring our attention to the space in the room. Also notice the space and silence within your own mind. Between the thoughts, around the thoughts, The mind in its very nature is spacious, quiet, still, peaceful. even when thinking is present. The essential nature of the mind is also present. When we pay attention to the stillness of the mind, quietude of the mind, and that quality grows. As we're nearing the end of the meditation, 
pay attention to every sensation of the air flowing in, pausing and flowing out. Open your eyes. But even with your eyes open, you're still breathing. Still pay attention to the air flowing in and the air flowing out. We end the meditation. Good afternoon, Tananjan. We would like to formally request for a Dharma talk. Good. Good. Dipati Sahampati Hatanjali Diwarakaya Chata Sandi Dasata Paraja Tajatika Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambutasa Udhang damang sanghang namasa Once again, greetings from Vimuti Monastery in New Zealand. Here in New Zealand, we are essentially living life as normal. We don't have any particular uh, change from last year or previous years. Coronavirus is essentially eradicated in New Zealand. So we're able to continue on with our, our normal schedule, our normal events. People come and stay in the monastery for periods of time. We have meditation workshops. Uh, we had uh, our Katina season uh, robe offering ceremony uh, just a couple of weeks ago. So uh, we're doing well here and it's the beginning of summer. So the weather is beautiful. Monastery is beautiful. When people come to stay in the monastery for a period of time, uh, when it comes time for them to uh, leave, then they will often ask for advice on, say, ah, John, got to go back to the real world. How am I going to practice in the real world? So first of all, I object to the term real world because whether you're here in a monastery or whether you're outside the monastery, essentially it's all seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and cognizing. And that's the world we live in. That is the, the essence of our reality. But 
even when you're in the monastery and you have uh, every supportive condition, right? Then it's still it'd be hard work to clarify what is reality, getting closer and closer to seeing truth as it actually is, seeing things, basically just seeing things as they truly are. But once you're outside the monastery, it is exceedingly more difficult. You can practice everywhere and we have to learn how to practice everywhere. But it's also realistic. You know, we need to be realistic that you know, within the monastery or retreat center or wherever you can temporarily stay, where everything we do is bringing us back to the Dhamma, right? Even if we want to be distracted here, it's pretty hard to be distracted for too long. Everybody here is, is uh, practicing meditation, right? So you can't get too distracted in conversations because people are into the Dhamma. Even if you go to the monastery looking for distraction, or even if you go to the library looking for distraction, then, uh, it's only Dhamma books. <laughs> so you can only distract yourself so far here. But once you drive out of the monastery gates, then it's kind of the opposite. Almost everything is pulling our attention away. People and their priorities, the speed with which they move, their intentions, the way they speak. Uh, the level of trust you can have with other people is different. Um, rather than a peaceful, natural environment, often people are living in a bit more chaotic or human-created environment. Uh, there's a lot of manifestations of human ego in, uh, in cities and towns. Just the noises can be impinging. So without a filter of mindfulness, it can be exhausting can be quite tiring for our minds. If you're living surrounded by nature, if you're not mindful for a while, if you have gaps in your mindfulness, then it's not so dangerous to our jitta or our mind, our heart. We just have the sounds of the birds, a view, pleasant view of nature, green trees, green grass, birds chirping, feeling of the wind on our skin, right? It's still relatively peaceful, even if we're not mindful. But if you are in a much more active environment, physical environment, family environment, work environment, then if we have gaps of not being strongly mindful, if we're not clearly mindful, then we tend to absorb all of the other people's emotions, the sounds, especially the unpleasant sounds can, can uh, leave quite an imprint on our minds. The unpleasant sounds that comes out of other people's mouths sometimes, uh, the concepts that we have to uh, get our heads around, so without strong mindfulness, living in a busy situation can be quite tiring. And if we don't have tools to maintain a certain sense of certain level of practice, then gradually it wears us down. The average person it just wears them down, becomes mentally exhausting, physically exhausting. And then before too long, people think, oh, I need to go do another retreat. So particularly in the Ajahn Chah tradition, we place a lot of emphasis on how do we integrate practice into daily life? When I say daily life, it doesn't mean life outside the monastery. In the monastery, we have daily life too. So we learn how to make ordinary things into practice, right? So for example, 
there's a lot of repetition in monastic life. The schedule is very repetitious. So in a sense, that can be quite supportive. And you can do the same thing at home. So we tend to do similar things every day. For example, we have our, we have our, one of our possessions is just our bowl, our monk's bowl. And there is a whole way to look after it properly. Some of it are, is actually rules in the vinya. Some of it is um, you know, monastic etiquette, but there's a whole proper way to look after one's bowl. So for example, after you eat, you wash the bowl, take care of it, dry the bowl, put it, there's, there's a particular way to do it. Now, every time we do it each day, try to be as aware as possible. So with this repetition, it's not like we are discovering new activities every day. But every time we do the same thing over and over again, if we do it with clear awareness, notice it is, it's different. And if with every time we do something, we make this effort, say this is my meditation right now. Because yeah, theoretically, try to make everything into meditation, but practically there are gaps. It's very difficult to be absolutely continuous. Meditation is sometimes strong, sometimes weak, sometimes disappears completely. So we try to increase our mindfulness with particular things that are happening every day. So for example, for us, might be washing our ball. It's a reminder. Now I'm washing my ball. This is my meditation object. I'm not chatting. When we eat, we eat in silence. The eating is our meditation. So each time we do that, it's an opportunity to reestablish mindfulness, make it stronger. If our mind wanders, be aware, accept it, let it go, come back. What are we doing? This is our meditation in action. So find things that you do every day, right? Some activities that you do every day, simple ones, simple things that are, uh, can be uh, an extension of your sitting meditation. Right? It's a very simple one that I rec regularly recommend is brushing your teeth. Of course, hopefully uh, everybody brushes their teeth at least once a day, maybe twice a day, maybe more. And if you brush your teeth regularly, instead of just te treating it like uh, a chore that you want to rush and get over with, get it over so you can get on to the more important things in life. Or while you're brushing your teeth, thinking about what do you have to do that day or what has already happened? You're thinking about other things. No, just, just take it as your meditation. This is my meditation. I'm gonna brush my teeth, right? It's like what, a minute, two minutes? But if you really put effort into paying attention, you know, just, and then you notice, oh, there's a lot of sensations there to pay attention to. Right? Every day, every time, it's probably pretty similar, but your mind is different, right? So yes, our, mind, our bodies move around, our postures change, our activities change, or relatively similar, but we can, it, we can use it as a way to establish our awareness in the present moment. And then when we do that, our train of thought, our mood, our particular emotion that we're feeling at that time, right, becomes much more clear. So that's uh, very beneficial. Right? And throughout the day, you can take little breaks. If you're sitting at your computer, 
after an hour or so, have a timer or remind yourself or just find a time to just stop, close your eyes, take three deep breaths, reestablish awareness with your body. Couple of deep breaths, it helps the body to relax, helps the mind to relax. It only takes about 15 seconds, but it can be very relaxing. And so we notice then, oh, has stress been gradually building up? Has uh, physical tension been gradually building up? Suddenly when we take a few breaths, we might notice, oh, I didn't, there's tension in your shoulders, a tension in your solar plexus. And it's only when we are aware of it that we have the opportunity to allow it to cease. And we see clearly, oh, if there's physical tension, that's dukkha, that's unpleasant. We can just let it go. If we don't stop and check and watch, then these things just keep perpetuating themselves. If there's physical tension, that's usually a result of mental tension and then the mental tension grows and accumulates and becomes a strong habit and then becomes more and more difficult and more and more pernicious. So finding ways throughout the day to maintain a sense of continuity begin to develop a continuity of clear awareness, right? rather than just saying, oh, I make everything into meditation. No, but specifically start with a few concrete activities. Right? Now, if you're, if you're living alone, it is easier. And uh, for example, when you eat, you just say, this is my meditation now, right? you're eating now, same attitude. You're sitting meditation, paying attention to breathing, physical sensations, and then when a thought arises, see the thought, whatever the content of the thought, doesn't really matter. Just accept it, it's just mental energy. Allow it to cease. Come back to the present, come back to physical sensations, come back to the activity that you're doing at that time. So you can do that while you're eating. Practice while you're walking. It's basic satipatthana, awareness of sitting, awareness of eating, awareness of walking. We all know how to walk. We have since we were two or less, I don't know baby start to walk. But walking mindfully is different. So even if we have been walking for 50 years, sometimes we still need to retrain ourselves, walk with clear awareness of our body. And if there are times where you feel like sitting meditation is feeling a bit drowsy, or you're tired in the morning or the evening, and just do walking meditation. Walking meditation is excellent. Just have a hallway or a room and just walk back and forth or outside in your yard or your garden. And any meditation that you're developing while you're doing sitting meditation, except for very deep states of samadhi, you can develop that while you're doing walking meditation. So you develop then continuity as sitting meditation comes to an end, maybe there's a bell, and then be aware of the idea that, ah, oh, now meditation is finished. No, it's just the physical posture may change. Med allow the meditation to continue. So when sitting meditation finishes, you open your eyes, Pay attention to the transition. What comes next? You're still breathing. You still have a body. You still have physical sensations. With your eyes open, there's many more things to be aware of. 
Can you bring in all of the, all of the sights without being distracted by them? It's just seeing. Sights, sounds, just seeing, just hearing. As you form the intention to get up, begin moving, pay attention to each stage, to continuing the meditation. Physical sensations change, posture changes, and then you gotta start walking, right? As soon as you take your first step, you're doing walking meditation. Paying attention to the feet coming in contact, the floor, ground, paying attention to the balance of your body, physical sensations within your body as you're walking, how you hold your body. There's a lot going on, even just walking back and forth, not going anywhere. See if you can keep your awareness generally around your body, within the one or two meters around your body. You still be aware of seeing, but just notice you're doing walking meditation and then suddenly you find yourself kind of like checking things out. Oh, look at that. What's up? So, well, what is, yeah. So, uh, recognize, oh, okay. We were distracted there. Our mindfulness had a gap. It's fine. Come back, start again. Just have to keep starting again and again and again. Keep coming back throughout the day. And that's where right effort comes into play. Every factor of the Noble Eightfold Path has to have right mindfulness and right effort. It has to be accompanied by that. So yeah, even just continuity of mindfulness takes a certain amount of effort to come back. Right? Just come back, recognizing what's the state of my mind right now. Are there wholesome states of mind, unwholesome states of mind? What's the current state of my mind? We encourage the wholesome, discourage the unwholesome. Keep the unwholesome at, at bay. Right. So then we gradually are bringing the wholesomeness, wholesome qualities of mind to fruition. Right? Make them stronger and stronger, allow them to develop. So this right effort has got to be there with every moment of mindfulness, even just perpetuating mindfulness, bringing our awareness back. That's already part of right effort. So then throughout the day, we begin to develop a bit of a bit more continuity. Real challenges come when you're dealing with other people. It's hard enough just to be alone, right? Even if you're just alone, then you may have to deal with a whole variety of mental states, but still, you know, your physical activities are relatively simple. If you're just, especially if you're sitting in a little hut in the forest. But then when you're dealing with other people in conversations, don't think of that as a, an obstacle to practice, but it is simply another form of practice. But don't underestimate how complicated that is. Right, right speech is part of the Noble Eightfold Path. So every time we're about to say something, What's our intention? Why are we going to say it? How, and uh, what words are we? What words do we choose to express concept in our mind? Or do we just blurt it out? Right? So if we're just blurting it out out of habit, or just uh, saying things, right? Saying things out of habit. You know, we, we tend to, we tend not to have always the best habits, <laughs> unless we've been working on it for a while, right? Then gradually develop good habits and speak, in speaking. But, you know, that, that does take some practice. And the only way we can really develop these wholesome, good habits in speaking, wise habits, wise speech, is through 
paying close attention. Right? And we all start with rather relatively rough habits of speech. So before you speak, and you're with somebody else and you think, okay, well, what's my intention in speaking? Is it wholesome? Uh, is it something, is it true, right? If it's, if you're about to say something and it's not true, then, I mean, don't even go there, right? But even if it's true, then we still have to consider, is this beneficial? Is it wise, is it useful, right? Or what's the purpose behind speaking? Uh, sometimes people speak just because they're afraid of the silence. And there's a certain amount of kind of social chit chat, which is, is still beneficial. It has a purpose, right? But some, it, sometimes it just goes way beyond what is useful. <laughs> it's just chatting and chatting, da, 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 just goes on. Da, 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 da. It's like, okay, how much is really useful? Right? Not everything is true. And not everything that is true needs to be said. Is another important point. Uh, there may be uh, a lot of things that are true, but then you have to think, is it beneficial? What emotions might it bring up in the other person? What reaction might it bring up in another person? Okay. So this is all about establishing clear awareness in our intention. But suddenly when we're with other people, it's not only this body, this mind, these perceptions, these concepts and ideas and this consciousness, consciousness, no, suddenly we've got another five kandas or more that we're also trying to take into account other people's communication, what they're trying to communicate, what they're expressing. Right? Communications, you know, human communication is relatively complicated. You got us get an idea, trying to transfer an idea from one person's jitta or brain or, or mind, it gets, uh, it gets condensed into a few words, which sort of, sort of inaccurate, not perfectly accurately represent that idea, that concept. And then it gets made into sounds and then whatever, people here, they, and that goes through many layers of interpretation to create another concept in their mind. And their layers of interpretation are maybe filters of what a mood they're in, uh, uh, how they perceive us, um, their personal history with those particular words. I mean, it gets, it's surprisingly complicated. So it's no wonder that Humans find it, humans are regularly arguing over ideas and opinions because it is challenging. But for us individually, then it is a fruitful area for developing a continuity of mindfulness. Basically, our responsibility is to try to do the best we can, right? And be clear and accurate in what we say mindful mindful before we speak of our intention as we're speaking watching where the conversation is going after we're finished with the conversation what was the result All right we may have good intentions and engage in the conversation but then after after it's over we think oh god that was a mistake right or we may have uh we may start a conversation in a in a wholesome way, and then gradually it leads towards um, criticizing other people behind their backs and gossiping. And then, we're, so even as the conversation is going along, you have to still maintain mindfulness. Is this this kind of speech is it leading to harmony or disharmony? Right. right? Any any time we're speaking or other people are speaking, and it's uh, increasing or conducive to disharmony between people, then we have to, should have some alarm bells going off that, uh, okay, maybe 
need to direct the conversation back or stop speaking. Sometimes it's right speech is just being silent. So there's all of these practical things we can do throughout the day to assist us in making mindfulness stronger and stronger. You know, we all have mindfulness, even, even like our four cats here in the monastery, they have mindfulness. They definitely have violence <laughs> and they have personalities and uh, they have moods. And they have, so they have mindfulness. It's just that their mindfulness is usually not very uh, refined or when they are very mindful, uh, our cats tend to direct it towards uh, breaking the precepts, unfortunately. Like we have lots of rabbits and bunnies around on the monastery. And uh, sometimes like, our cats will be like sitting meditation at the rabbit hole for hour, and like, like hours and hours just patiently waiting, watching, waiting and watching, waiting and watching. And it's a shame that they couldn't do that in the meditation hall, right? Because the intention that they're developing is they're using all that mindfulness and, and samadhi. They're actually developing samadhi focused attention, but with the intention of killing and harming. So, I've tried many methods to, 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 uh, to take, to try to teach them how to, if you could just take that same focused awareness, but have a wholesome intention, you really, you know, probably have a good rebirth and get out of the animal realm. So even cats have focused attention. Certainly people have focused attention. But just being mindful in and of itself is not enough. It has, you have to combine it with other aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path. So, such as right intention, right? If you are, if you're sneaking into a house at night to steal something, yeah, you have to be pretty mindful. <laughs> Otherwise you're not gonna be good at it. You have to have certain samadhi, you know, be calm, aware. You have to have awareness of your surroundings. So yeah, there's a lot of uh, things that are like similar to our first satipatthana, mindfulness of the body, and awareness. But the intention is all wrong. The intention is to steal, which creates suffering. So you know, so then all of those wholesome qualities then get perverted. They're diverted into an unwholesome activity. So this is, you know, stuff that we deal with in other ways throughout, you know, all of us our, our whole life. Maybe we're not intentionally harming other living beings through killing them or sneaking into other people's houses to steal things. But there are more subtle versions of you know, how, how we interact with others. Is it leading to harm in some way? Or what's our true intention? Just keep checking. You know, we can, even if our intention is more neutral, we can do better than that. It's like if you work at a job that in some way helps other people, then if you don't bring that intention up, you're missing the opportunity to create a, a huge amount of good karma, wholesome karma. Let's say I working in a hospital, or even if you're just working in a retail store, right? You know, there's gonna be a lot of things which are, are helping other people. They're beneficial to other people. And if you only uh, do it, if your only intention is just to be there to make money and get home, and you're just kind of blindly going through the motions, then that's the karma that we make. It's essentially, you know, we don't make a lot of wholesome karma. We may not make any unwholesome karma, but we don't make a lot of wholesome karma. But if you shift your perception around many ordinary activities, then that's literally creating the reality that we live in. 
how we perceive things. What is our intention? If you, let's say you're working at a cash register and somebody is buying something and then you, you, you could just blindly go through the motions or you can uh, kind of takes a little effort to bring up this intention. Yeah, may this person be happy, right? May they be happy. I'm doing something that is useful for them. I'm helping them in some way, right? Most of the jobs that people do for a living in some way are beneficial to other people. So then you have to kind of bring that up, remind yourself all the time. How am I helping somebody else? Yeah, it's actually beneficial. Bring that up. Give yourself credit for that. That it's wholesome. It's like remind, give yourself wholesome credit for things, right? It's very important. Uh, sometimes people are way too self-critical. And so if that comes up, then you, it's good to be aware of that, right? If you don't notice it, it just perpetuates and, and will continue. There will be nothing, it won't stop on its own. So just notice, oh, are you being overly critical of yourself? Notice that. And then, uh, and if you are, then you notice, oh, I'm doing it again. Be critical of yourself for being self-critical. So just each time, don't worry, it's just past conditioning. It's not nothing to do with us personally. It's just social, personal conditioning that these habits form. Just notice it, see it, be aware. And then you give yourself permission just to let it go. You don't need that. It's just rubbish. Let it go. And then give yourself credit for the good things that you do. You know, sometimes uh, people are really wonderful people and they do a lot of, lot of good in the world, but they don't pay attention. They don't bring their attention or give themselves due credit for the good that they do in the world. Could just be um, parents. Parents do a lot. Help your child out. Could be the work that you do. You don't have to be, don't have to like be a saint in order to uh, be helping people throughout the day, but just bring your attention and say, oh, uh, when I did this, it was actually helpful to this other person. Or when I refrained from you know, when I was irritated and I refrained from, from blasting somebody or expressing my, my anger, and I didn't get flying into a rage, you know, give yourself credit for that. It's like, oh, okay, good. I, you know, don't set the bar too high. <laughs> it's just like, oh, I didn't kill anyone today. That's good. It's good. You know, you start with the low expectation and you'll build up from there. So it's an actual meditation, uh, reflection on the times that we've been helpful and generous. Like at the end of every day, right? You're really trying to make daily life into, into practice. So at the end of the day, just take some time and reflect uh, on all of the helpful, good things that you did throughout that day. Right? So this is not, this is not like um, bolstering our ego. Oh, I'm such a wonderful person. I'm so holy. No, it's just giving ourselves recognition for the good karma, the wholesome karma that we've made throughout the day. And then the natural result of that is joy, yeah? sense of self respect, a sense of wholesome self respect, right? I mean, ultimately, we're not all dealing with the, uh, the depths of anatta and non-self, quite often we need to relate to ourselves and others on a more conventional level of self. That's fine, that's, that's valid. So a wholesome sense of self-respect based on recognizing how much good we do in the world, or at least we've tried, even if we make mistakes, 
fine. We recognize that, forgive ourselves, keep trying. Then, uh, then uh, life becomes a lot more I think, enjoyable. And you know, it's a practical way that people can practice, even if you're, even if you're stuck with your family in quarantine. <laughs> Just take it as a teaching. Yeah, it's like, okay, this is my quarantine retreat. And uh, retreats are not necessarily all about feeling still peaceful samadhi. What is beneficial can sometimes particularly be challenging. So you look for these areas where Anyway, so there's, there's much more to talk about practical ways to, to bring uh, meditation into daily life. And don't forget about, you know, actual sitting meditation. It's like, yes, we're trying to make every activity into meditation, but sometimes we just need to sit, close your eyes, don't do anything and don't put pressure on yourself. Oh, now I have to meditate and be successful at meditation. No, just, just sit, relax, give yourself a break. You see, meditation is a, it's an opportunity just to refresh, relax, allow your body to relax. You don't have to worry about anything. If worries come up, see them, go. Don't have to deal with that. Just tell yourself, not now. Deal with that later. Just allow yourself some time to take the pressure off of yourself. And that's refreshing. We, we need that in order to, to uh, be able to find a, a balance uh, that we can sustain daily life. And you know, it's helpful to have little reminders around the house sometimes. If you have uh, if you have one area of your house that is like your little shrine corner, then that can be a good reminder. Right? Um, if you have a big house and have a whole room, it's just your meditation room. Make a little shrine, meditation cushion. But even if you just have one part of one room, that has a shrine and then you meditate there. And it's like a little, you know, a perception of a little sacred space. And uh, that can be used in a very uh, wise way. My mother has a, quite a nice shrine. Full disclosure, my mother's watching today. <laughs> she watches, uh, I think, almost every Zoom talk that I do. And my mother has a really, uh, She's got a beautiful shrine. Over the years, I've given her lots of uh, Buddha statues and, and um, other things. And she's gradually then added her own uh, bits and pieces and photographs and then created a kind of quite a nice, beautiful shrine. And uh, so then that becomes a place for her to, uh, to meditate or to reflect, um, a reminder. It's something that we can all do. You have to find ways in daily life to, to uh, keep reminding ourselves because, you know, we know, but then we, we get caught up in things and we forget. You have to keep reminding ourselves, keep coming back, being, being grounded, balanced, peaceful. Remember your true intentions. Why are you doing this? What are your values? What do you want out of life? Keep coming back to your, your true intentions, your deepest intentions and values. And uh, that will help to give some clarity and direction, even in the midst of busy life. So I offer this for your reflection. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Tanajan.
Kadamase Sadu Sadu